started. Um, I'd like to introduce Lorenzo Gioni, is the product line manager for Cisco High-End Routing and Optical Business Unit, also known as Hero. Lorenzo has over 15 years experience in telecommunications and product management, mainly focused on transport solutions and architectures. He's been with Cisco since 2000, and he has invo been involved in the long-haul and extended long-haul products, and has been focused on flexible and integrated transport networks for the last 11 years. Lorenzo. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me OK, even with the mic set up as it is? Or do you need me to do like Madonna type of things? <laughs> Tell me that I don't need to use the mic, please. You define Good, I like it. I, I take that answer as a true one. Good. OK, so uh, first off, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm not from US. So and I, English is not my first language. Anything that comes out in a funny way or strange way, just let me know, because chances are I'm trying to make up words or sentences. So raise your hand. Let me know if I'm absolutely not clear. And I'll try my best to find a different way of explaining myself, OK? Good. I know it's tough after lunch and everything like this, but I'll, I'll try to keep it as interactive as possible. To that extent, if you have questions, challenges, uh, I mean, up to the point where you don't throw bottles at me, I'm perfectly fine. Uh, I brought another guy from Italy. If you want to throw bottles at him, he's sitting at the right <laughs> end. OK, so that's just in case. All kidding aside, so um, I've been asked to present about high speed, capacity, high speed and capacity networks. So I put together some slides, and, and really, Please keep it interactive, because uh, there are some ideas, uh, some direction about what we're doing. But obviously, the best is uh, if you have questions and if we can have some discussion about those points and just making sure that what I'm presenting makes some sense and is applicable to uh, what's your understanding of your needs in everyday uh, life, OK? That all being said, so let me, uh, let me start with an high-level slide, and it's really the only high-level marketing slide that I have in the deck, so bear with me. Once this is done, we're done for the day. Um, the, uh, I wanted to talk about the Cisco Enlight technology. I don't know if you have heard, ever heard about Enlight. We use a bunch of different marketing terms or terminology, but above and beyond those, I think what uh, is really important about what we're doing is, uh, is the fact that uh, we are investing pretty heavily into uh, let's say, automatism, control plane, as well as uh, hardware solution to make sure that we can keep up with the pace of evolution of the, of the networks uh, that, that we are seeing. So there are three major points that we are spending money and time on. The first one is control plane. So control plane, you probably have heard of something like SDN or software-defined networks or control plane, GMPLS, those type of things. Uh, and uh, this is uh, above and beyond all of the different marketing uh, you know, hypes about SDN. There is a lot of truth to that where it comes to really making sure that the network can be as much as possible automatized moving forward. And that, even more importantly, we have an opportunity to optimize across the different layers of the network. In the past, uh, you have probably said uh, transport, uh, that being Sonnet or DWDM, was kind of uh, the underlying technique that was there in every, in every network that was deployed. And then internet and IP were the services where the monetization was happening. If you look at the situation today, uh, I would say that internet and IP are pretty much, uh, quote unquote, part of uh, the uh, transport type of uh, um, environment. So it's pretty common to say or to see that monetization happen yet again at an higher level of the network. So you can see this happening on services you, you probably have heard of over the top uh, or those type of definitions. So why is control plane important is mainly because of the fact that we need to make sure that whatever sits in the layers three and below is uh, um, as much as possible automatic and uh, uh, also, um, let's say, very well structured to make sure that uh, there is optimization happening. And that's where we are investing. And that's where, in my view, SDN is very important because it's creating this multi-layer orchestration type of an environment where the DWDM, eventually the OTN layer, Ethernet and IP can really share understanding of the network and share uh, constraints and share definition of uh, what is needed so that the optimization can be done across the layers and not one layer at a time. 
for this to become effective, we definitely need to have capabilities in the network so that we can support all of these automatism and multi-layer orchestration. So if you have a, a solution that is pretty much tied to a specific degree or a specific direction of the network, even tied to a specific bit rate of the wavelength and so forth, there's not a lot that software can do to re-optimize uh, the network as a whole. And that's where we, again, spending money on the concept of n light ROIDM, so defining uh, the next generation of ROIDM in terms of flexibility, capacity, and so forth, that would allow us to really take uh, all of the transport uh, baseline of network and make it self-sufficient, uh, self, uh, but also make it such that you can uh, uh, optimize it as uh, the evolution of the traffic goes on. Light but not, last but not least, uh, there is an, a huge investment that is going on in the silicon arena. So you probably have heard the terms about NPU as the network processing unit or DSP as the digital signal processing. Those are key technology at this point uh, for us to really make sure that we can overall uh, improve on the, not only on the transmission distance that you can support, but also on the capacity that you can put on the network. So up to probably five years ago, it would have been pretty common to say, I have an 80 channels by 10 gigabit per wavelength system, and that is kind of less than a terabit of DWDM transport capacity overall that you can put in the network. If you look at what's available today, wavelengths are already running at 100 G per second. So eight wavelength DWDM system will match a, a, that capacity of 800 G. And we're really looking at something that is 96 channel at 100 G today, getting into 96 channel at 200 G by the end of the year. And it's just a rush of making sure that you can keep up with uh, not only the capacity, but also the distance that you need to transport this capacity uh, across. And that's another important thing. In the past, uh, the transport layer, the DWDM layer, was the same irrespectively of the distance. If you would have had to cover 500 kilometers or 500 miles or 1,000 miles, the system was exactly the same. Now what we have is the DSP, so the uh, digital signal processing that happens for every one of the wavelengths, it will be is and will be allowing us even more and more to fine trim the capacity to the distance. So it's similar to what uh, you're probably familiar with DSL as a concept where depending on how far you live or how close you live to the central office, you can get better or, or worse bandwidth. We are taking the same approach and applying it to DWDM. And because of the fact that we are in, in investing on control plane optimization and control plane orchestration, there is also a lot of possibility for us to make sure that the capacity at the pure transport DWDM layer can actually be matching up uh, the capacity at the MPU, so the switch and the router, so that at the end of the day, layer three and below, there is a complete understanding of how far am I going, and as a result, you can get the capacity that you can uh, transmit, and vice versa, you can extend the concept of a commit bit rate and a burst bit rate that is uh, everyday technology on Ethernet and apply it to DWDM as well, which is a piece of a novelty of, uh, of what we are doing. Assuming that all of these make sense, what I would like to do is uh, let, set aside for a second the discussion about control plane, which we can discuss after the, after the speech, if you like, but really focus on ROIDM and uh, the silicon piece and show you where we are and where we are uh, driving the technology uh, for moving forward, okay? So first piece is, okay, Transport capacity, as I said, five years ago, 80 wavelength by 10G, so 800G overall capacity on a DWDM system. How do I go any better than that? I think there are at least two different ways of doing it. The first one is, rather than running 10G wavelength, I start putting more capacity per wavelength, 100G or more. So what I'm gonna do is uh, look for ways of breaking the let's say ADC bandwidth. So the analog to digital converter is a key technology that is needed for DSP or for uh, what is called coherent optical transmission to really be usable in DWDM networks now and moving forward. Uh, and that's where uh, we can, so to say, increase the modulation efficiency and looking at solution where uh, in the same portion of the spectrum I can pack more information compared to what I was able to do in the past. Vice versa, if you look at the pure DWDM system, 10 years ago, it was like 100 gigahertz channel spacing. 
and more recently we moved to a 50 gigahertz channel spacing, is that the limit? Not really. I mean, it's not needed for us to stay on a 50 gigahertz. There are actually big motivation as we will look forward, uh, as we progress to the presentation, I hope you'll, you'll appreciate that. There are a lot of motivation for us to say, OK, can I just make the channel spacing a function of the distance and the capacity that I want to transmit? The answer is absolutely yes. And I think it's helping a lot uh, along the line of what is happening, for example, on uh, digital satellite transmission or digital TV transmission. The similar techniques can be applied to DWDM and give us an opportunity, again, to trade in capacity for distance or really have the control plane tell us, given how much capacity we want to transmit between, transport between two points, what's the best way of optimizing these, uh, these transport capacity. So looking at those, uh, those two pieces, um, basically starting from the second one, what we have started to do is uh, first take an action of saying the C-band de definition of uh, give or take 32 nanometer uh, can actually be extended a bit. So in 32 nanometer, 50 giga channel spacing, you can fit 80 wavelengths. But the evolution of the amplifier technology is actually allowing us to have uh, some additional channel added to both ends of the spectrum, a bit less in the, let's say, left-hand side and a bit more on the uh, right-hand side toward the 1560 uh, nanometer range. And that by itself can give us the opportunity to grow by about 20% uh, in terms of the number of wavelengths that can be supported. So moving from 80 to 96 channel, again, just using the 50 giga channel spacing uh, terminology. But even more important, what we want to do is uh, look for technology that allow us to increase uh, the number of degrees and the flexibility of our ADMs. Why is this relevant? I think it's absolutely relevant because of the fact that uh, in the past, it was pretty common to say, I have me my DWDM system that is a point-to-point -point system. And I, I just uh, terminate all of the traffic in the electronic domain at the edges, and I have uh, some uh, switches, routers, sonnet machine, OTN, whatever you like, something that in the electronic domain was kind of bridging the gap between a DWDM system. But if you look at the cost of doing so, and also if you look at uh, how the traffic pattern is evolving, that, that does make no sense now and even moving forward. There is a, a high vi variability of traffic in the traffic pattern today for which regenerating at each point and uh, having uh, electronic switching happening at the end uh, of DWDM system would make it absolutely anti-economical. And so that's where AeroADM and multi-degree AeroADM have been star started to become more and more popular. And in fact, is one of the technology that lately has exploded in terms of applicability application, not only for metro, access, or regional, but also for the long haul application. And why we need more AeroADM port is just because of the fact that uh, there are more and more situations where uh, multiple, multiple networks are uh, terminated in the same point, and uh, there is a need of allowing traffic flowing across different pieces of the network more than in the past. So I work uh, quite a bit with cable operators, over the tops, uh, uh, customer, and, and even service provider. And you can really see a situation where uh, there is a hierarchical view of the network with access, regional, and then backbone. And there are a number of situations where you need to terminate multiple access or multiple regional network in the same place of, uh, of the network before you enter the long haul on the backbone. And that's where the number of degrees or the, the, like, the degree of meshiness, if this makes any sense in English, really continues, needed to continue to improve. And so that's where we have spent uh, time and energy. And we recently come out with this concept of flex spectrum. I don't know if you ever heard of these. Somebody else call it gridless. Uh, I actually don't like too much the, the gridless definition because it's like uh, clueless. You know, you don't really know what you're doing. Uh, so uh, flex spectrum makes it a more, quote unquote, polite. But all kidding, kidding aside, this goes back to the uh, discussion or the point I was trying to make before. 50 giga channel spacing is just uh, a limitation that technology was having up to, say, one year ago. Now, Flex Spectrum allows us to really define the channel in the software 
through the ROIDM as we need it to be. So the channel spacing or the definition of the channel is now something that the software will allow us to define. Why is this important? It's important because of the fact that uh, first we can uh, uh, pack more information in the same portion of the spectrum where before we had the 50 giga channel spacing. <clears throat> the other important piece is the fact that moving forward, if you look at wavelength that will become 250, 400 G, 500 G, or a terabit, the, depending on the different type of modulation format that we will be coming up using, the channel width or the overall bandwidth that you need to allocate in the, sp in the frequency domain to be able to transport that information is not only a function of the distance that you need to, 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 to support, but is also something that may change over time. And so that's where having the possibility in the software to provision, um, let's say the way you define the channel is, 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 uh, is now and will become even more so in the future very, very important. And it ties back in the control plane orchestration point that I was making at the very beginning. Once you know the capacity that you need to transport between two points, there is a possibility for the control plane to exchange information with the upper layers of the network, with the physical information, in the, getting the physical information from the network, and understand uh, which are my path options to go between source and destination. How much of a linear and nonlinear effect do I need to, to balance? And depending on that, I can use different modulation format, and depending on that, I can use uh, fewer or less uh, portion of the spectrum, which ties back into the way I provision my services. Does this make sense? Oh, silence is yes or no? <laughs> that's tough to understand. OK, let's assume. I'm sorry. It does make sense, but I have a question about the, the tunability of the lasers. That's a good question. So just making sure everybody gets the question. So tunability of the lasers. That's, in fact, a one very important point. So in the past, uh, we started off of lasers that were tunable on 100 gigahertz. And then uh, we now are very comfortable with 50 gigahertz tunability. What we foreseeing happening is that probably by the end of the year, we'll be able to sell lasers that are stable on one gigahertz. And that is clearly important for this application. This is something we're testing out in our lab. And I don't see any, any let's say, limitation with that. Actually, the next challenge that we'll be able to face or that we will need to face is uh, how quickly can a laser tune across different wavelengths? Because if you get into a, some situation like this, and I don't know how many of you use uh, Windows or anything like that, or are familiar with the old uh, defrag uh, program that was in Windows. <laughs> that was cool, right? OK. So we can actually apply it to optical network moving forward. So my expectation is that. As soon as you have a software programmable way of defining capacity and services into the network, as time goes by, you may end up in a situation where you look at the network and say, OK, I, I made pretty much of a mess. Let me clean it up. <laughs> and that's the def defrag, uh, defrag opportunity. I mean, kidding aside, that I think is very important because of the fact that uh, somebody some time ago said, uh, Network operators have the luxury of being greenfield only once in a lifetime. And after that, you have a lot of legacy uh, traffic or situation that you need to carry over, which is kind of holding you to reality where you would like to do something exceptional. Uh, with these and the possibility to be able to re-optimize the traffic, put this in the perspective of having a control plane or an SDN engine that is there, can suck information out of the network and say, OK, let me look at what you've done and uh, reshuffle things around, re-optimize it, come back to you and say, OK, this is how much you would be able to gain, capacity, distance, performances, latency, you name it. And then you can re-look at this and say, OK, I like this better than my current situation. Push it back to the network. And that's very important. That's the reason why I think we needed to invest on this technology uh, more and more moving forward. So. Not, being, not wanting to do a product pitch, but just to let you know that this is available in our portfolio. So I'm not talking about something that is uh, you know, out in the future. You don't, don't know where it is. We have a 16-port uh, Flex Spectrum ROADM device that is in our product catalog today. 16 ports, why is that important? 16 port allows us to support the 17 degrees ROADM. So it speaks to the opportunity or the need uh, of making sure that you have more connected networks. 
The other piece that is important is the fact that the unit support flex spectrum. So you can start with a channel definition that is 50 gigahertz, and then you can grow it in increment of 12 and a half uh, gigahertz. So you can define channels that are 62 and a half, 75, uh, uh, 87 and a half, and so on and so forth. So that's important because of the fact that it, it, it really speaks to the fact that we can have a solution that can adapt to the different traffic pattern or the different situation moving forward. What we did also on top of this is to define a new set of amplifiers, which we call EDRA, a lot of, you know, lot of invention, a lot of fantasy there, Airbnb doped Raman amplifier, where we integrated the standard EDFA with uh, counter-propagating Raman. And the idea there is to make sure that we can really optimize the noise figure on each and every one of the nodes of the network. Again, why is this important? I think it's important because of the fact that uh, once you have this uh, software control on the way you design and implement networks, you certainly don't want to be in a situation where you fall short of OSNR just because of the fact that you optimize the network for today traffic and not really looking forward to may what may happen in a couple of years or five years out. So EDRAs is something that gives us the opportunity to always minimize the OSNR uh, sorry, the noise figure for every location of the network, hence uh, providing the best possible OSNR no matter what. We still support that the, quote unquote, old EDFA only amplifiers, there's no limitation with that, and we can do that, but we think that this in combination with the 16 port ROADM is the best way of, you know, kind of designing future proof high capacity network. Taking one step further, something that we are working on is really taking those technologies and going integrating more and more. So I don't know if you heard uh, us uh, talking about a, an SMR, so a single module ROADM unit in the past, uh, but really what this unit give us an opportunity to do is integrate the optical switching gear and the optical amplifi amplification required for an ROADM, for a single degree of an ROADM, down to a single slot unit. So this has been extremely important for us in the past for 40 channel network design, allowing us to take ROADM to pieces of the network, which in the past were using just a fixed OADM or you know, all, some situation where you really needed to patch connection and change the topology of the network uh, manually and so on and so forth. So our goal here is to make sure that we can take flex spectrum and ROADM all the way to the edge of the network, which is probably where the majority of the changes or the, of the, or the, let's say, flexibility will be required moving forward. So this is something we're working on. It's targeted by the end of this year. And uh, what I think is very important is the fact that despite the fact we're going integrating more functionality, we can support with this type of a device 20 port instead of the 16 port that we can support today. So not only has better density, but it also has uh, an, an higher number of ports that we can leverage on to be able to support more interconnection and more flexible networks. There is another, another piece of, uh, the, uh, of the equation that I haven't really talked about so far, but is very, very important. So how many of you have heard the term contentionless? Wow. I'm really saying something new. Good. Oh, you heard it. You got that. OK, good. For the majority of you, I'm saying something new, so I should, I should have made my day. All kidding aside, um, contentionless sudden drop. What is this all about? So if you look at networks deployed uh, leveraging on, uh, on Sonnet, for example, what I think uh, made the Sonnet very important is the fact that uh, there was complete separation of how you, have, uh, you had uh, the traffic entering the network and how this traffic was mapped at the network level. So, there was no relationship into which port am I plugging my OC3 into in defining where that OC3 was going out of a single node. So it could have gone left, right, left and right, protected, unprotected, and it was possible via software to change the way the traffic was mapped to the Sonnet world. Now, DWDM is not quite yet at that level. You still have some situation where if I'm plugging my transponder to a specific ROADM, I can get that traffic going out, say, one degree of the network, but I cannot re redirect it and so forth. So the contentionless piece is really summarizing uh, the omnidirectional, the colorless, and the 
um, tunable uh, characteristic of the add and drop portion of the ROADM network in such a way that you can fully decouple the add and drop from the network side of, of any given node. So this is kind of a situation where I can have transponders connected to one node, and uh, I don't have to worry about, am I using the right wavelength? Uh, have I connected the right port, uh, uh, the transponder to the right port? Am I able to protect the traffic or not? All of these can be taken into account inside of the software side of the house, and the contentionless unit plus the ROADM is what makes it possible, all of these. There's no magic, I mean, believe it, believe it or not, but uh, it's a very important step uh, because of the fact that uh, there has been a lot of integration and a lot of, uh, um, let's say, study done to make sure that you can have different flavors of the network and address not only big location, but also location where you may have like four channels up to four degrees and you want to have an, an economical solution to be able to address both of them in, in, a, at the same time. Uh, making sure that on one side you don't overspend on a small node, but vice versa, if you have a pretty big node where traffic is growing in volume, you don't want to end up in a situation where the capacity of the network doesn't keep up with the capacity that you need in that specific location. So again, something that we are working on for the targeting the end of this year, and we're gonna have a 16 port and a four port uh, uh, solution. The four port solution is kind of the edge targeting one, so it's four channels that can be shared across four degrees uh, with no limitation and no contention. The other solution has 16 channels that can be shared across four degrees, but then can grow uh, to eight or 12 degrees as well. And is in service upgradable, so there's no limitation whatsoever that you can encounter in, in, uh, in evolving the network like this. Okay? So far so good? Still awake? Somebody need a coffee? <laughs> Somebody need translation? <laughs> I cannot help you with that. So if this makes sense, let's look at the wavelength side of the house, OK? So what we have today available, as I said, uh, 100G solution. We have a single slot line card that is a multi-purpose line card, the one at the top. Uh, we're using it to be able to do transponder applications. So not sure if this makes sense or not, but we have a client-facing pluggable optics on the line card. We have the full C-band tunable trunk uh, port here at the bottom. And what we can support is pure 100G mapping on a wavelength. It can be 100 gig, it can be OTU4, uh, you name it. But basically the point is uh, this can serve as a standalone unit to do uh, transponder, pure transponder application. Use the top one in combination with the bottom and what we can achieve is a solution where we can take up to 10, 10 gigs or OC192 or OTU2s aggregate them through the backplane on the 100G, and then send them out as a wavelength. So this has been, I don't want to sound bold in any shape or form, but uh, this has been extremely successful for us. I think we have passed the mark of 5,800 100G DWDM units in the past 18 months. So we started shipping them 18 months ago, and we, are, we have passed the mark of 5,800 units. So, Again, don't want to sound bold, but is, I'm pretty proud of what we have been able to achieve. And I think this speaks to itself about how 100G is becoming popular and how much is important for it to evolve uh, uh, to keep up the pace of the demand. Um, what we are using on, on, this, uh, on this unit to make sure we can have 100G on a single slot uh, is uh, a technology that is called CPAC. I don't know if you have heard of the term or not, but um, so, CPAC is the result of an acquisition that we did about one year ago of Lightwire. Uh, so Lightwire was an independent company, and uh, we went acquiring them mainly because of the fact that they demonstrated they can build a modulator, modulator unit using silicon photonics uh, that is very small and is very efficient. And so the two things combined is what allows us to have a very small form factor that is the CPAC to be able to house 100G pluggable clients. Just to give you a perspective, I have done a summary here on the slide. I'm sorry, I didn't add the physical samples, but this is just a reference of CFP to, to your left uh, is basically the standard today, okay? It's pretty big, so dimension here are to scale, so I'm not exaggerating them to just look better. Uh, this is, these are the real number. 
So CFP is the standard today. It's not only pretty big, so it uses a lot of real estate on the line card, but it's also power angry a lot. Like the specs of the CFP are 32 watt for a 100G interface, which is not a lot if you put it in the perspective of 10G some years ago. But compare it with the CPAC, we can get the CPAC doing exactly the same thing for less than 7.5 watt. And is exactly the same type of uh, client-facing interface. Thank you. So it's something where you can take a CPAC 10G, 100 gig LR4, connect it to a CFP, will just work. CPAC is just more optimized because of the silicon photonics. There are a number of other pluggable interfaces, not spending time on it, but it's just to show you how, unfortunately, I think the in industry is repeating a, a bit of the same mistake that we did in the 10G arena. So what we're doing is, we went shopping for light wire and making sure that CPAC was available to give a, a very direct indication to the market. We cannot, at 100G, waste money into a number of different pluggable interfaces. We need to be crisp and make sure that we nail the problem exactly. Now, what we're also investing on is specifically on the DWDM side, the DSP stands for the Digital Signal Processing. Uh, I have a bit of an history here, bear with me, but it's just to show you how in just the range of a couple of years, we move from a solution that was discrete, having different components that had to be mounted on the same board, all the way into the latest version of the 100G, which is the second generation of the 100G DSP, as an internal code name of Aetna, just uh, you know, in case you want to know it. But why is this important? It's important because of the fact that First of all, it's the first time we are able to have a DSP that is able to handle different modulation formats. So you can do BPSK, QPSK, 16 QAM, and you can do multiple bit rate at the same. So the same piece of silicon can deal with 50G per wavelength all the way up to 250G per wavelength. And the way you configure this is completely by software. So a unit can have the DSP mounted and can be able to use different bit rate to the, to the wavelength. Another very important piece is the fact that for the first time ever, we are leveraging on digital to analog converter so that we can have a transmit signal shaper built in into the DSP. Why is that important? Any guess? DSP, transmit signal shaping, okay. So if you look at modulated signal, uh, what you normally get is you have a very nicely shaped rectangular electronic pulse you look at it on the, uh, on the optical side of the house, and it looks like a main lobe with a bunch of side lobes that extend the overall dimension of the signal. Is any of these side lobes needed? Not really. There's no information that you cannot retrieve from the center lobe. So what the transmit signal shaping allows us to do is really to get rid of the tails and just preserve the center or the si center side lobe of the signal. Again, why does it matter? It matters because if I can limit my signal in the optical domain, all of a sudden what I can do is I can squeeze more capacity, more wavelength into the same, into the same portion of the spectrum. So if you want to see this animated, this is basically what happens. You move from 50 gigahertz design network, you apply DSP, do this, uh, transmit signal shaping, which means that I can remove, reduce the portion of the spectrum if I get rid of this 50 gigahertz uh, type of limitation in the hardware and I make something that is flex spectrum, then what I can achieve is really the possibility of squeezing wavelength. Bear with me, there's a bit of an error in the animation. The channel will not overlap. They should just <laughs> get close to each other. I wasn't able to fix it yesterday, so I apologize for that. But So this is not completely accurate. They don't overlap, just, just to make sure. Now, once we're doing this, why, again, why is this important? What, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about different modulation format, different bit rate, and uh, different channel spacing. You probably have seen this picture already, but if you, if you haven't, this is basically plotting the distance that, we, that can be achieved without regeneration in kilometers versus the overall capacity that you can put on the wavelength. And so if you look at a standard system today, uh, assuming an 80 channel uh, 50 gigahertz system, what you can do is 8 terabit per second, assuming 80 channel at 100 gig, 50 gigahertz channel spacing. 
Now, why 50 gigahertz? It's an industry-wide definition, but if you forget about that, leverage on, on transmit signal shaping, Nyquist filtering, we can take 100G channels down to 33.3 gigahertz of spacing. That by itself will allow us to move from 8 terabit to 12 terabit on a fiber. So that's important because you can pump more capacity in the same DWDM infrastructure that you have. Not only that, but map it to the distance that can be covered. So when you do 52, 33, and, and one third, uh, there's a slight, let's say, the, um, um, impact on performances, but you can still cover a lot of long goal application. What if you don't care about long goal? Then you start using a different modulation format like 16 QAM, and at that point what you can do is trade in distance for capacity. So you start having something that can drive all of up to 24 terabit per fiber, and the distance can be still in the range of 500 to, a ter uh, of to 1,000 kilometers. So that's where it is important to have this flexibility and being able to say, via software, or better, via control plane, I can determine, depending on the distance that I want to cover, how much capacity I can use, or depending on the capacity that I want to pump uh, into the wavelength, what's the best way for me to map that capacity? So. I know you were going to give me the time check. Sorry. So just to, to let, you, let you know that we are investing on something like this. And our end goal is to really make sure that uh, through the evolution of the technology, say, coming mid of next year, we'll be able to have a fully flexible single slot line card that can be used to have uh, from 50 to 250 gigabit per wavelength and uh, being able to use uh, this uh, flex spectrum as well as uh, uh, Nyquist filtering capability. By the end of this year, we will have the same capacity, but uh, will be, uh, let's say, not fully integrated in a single slot line card. We'll be able to, we will have to leverage on, on two line cards to do that. And so this is just an example of how we're going to evolve the, not only the system capacity, but also the density. And you can see here, we've stepped off about six months uh, June of this year, end of this year, and June of next year, how we can effectively get by June of, uh, of next year or mid of next year with a solution that pretty much leverages on two different line cards and control plane plus software tunability uh, to be able to achieve a, a super channel or much bigger capacity on, on DWDM system. Is this is all, not really, but I'm almost done. We're spending, so, we're spending some time hey, to, more. <laughs> exactly, spending some time more to evolve on the DSP. And, you know, something that we want to do is continue this evolution. So we said 16 QAM. If you look at other, let's say, technologies, the satellite, ADSL, and so on and so forth, there's a different, even more complex modulation format, like 64 QAM. We definitely want to port that in DWDM. What I think is also even more important is this concept of flex modulation uh, hybrid modulation techniques uh, where uh, effectively once you have the tunability into the DSP to be able to support different modulation format, what we can do is uh, get to a point where I can use in a time slot interchange uh, different modulation formats. So the DSP, the laser, all of the optical receiver and so forth needs to be able to change modulation format very, very frequently, very, very fast uh, in such a way that uh, when I look at the capacity that I can transport, I end up having uh, a, a, a lot of flexibility into what I can put on a wavelength. What do I mean with that? I can end up with something that via software can allow me to change with 25 uh, uh, gigabit per second interval the capacity that I can map to a wavelength. So I can start off with 25 gigabit per wavelength and start from there and say 25 to 50 to 75 and so on and so forth all the way up to 400G a wavelength. So if this resonates very well in your mind with Ethernet, then you are on the right track, I think, because this is really what we want to drive. Get to a point where the NPU and the DSP can actually exchange information and get to understand each other so that if I'm designing a network, I have extra margin from an OSNR perspective and so forth, I can use that extra margin to pump up uh, the bit rate that I can support on the network. Uh, it's, it's basically introducing at the DWDM layer the commit bit rate versus the bust bit rate 
that has been so successful and so important in Ethernet or, or packet networks. And this is really where we are aiming at going. So implementing more and more this technology uh, for DWDM networks moving forward. Is this behind the corner? Not exactly, but it's a couple of years out. So it's not something impossible to achieve. It's something where we are spending time and energy on right now. So the question is, how, how's the power related to the bit rate? Um, there are some implications, meaning that when you put more power, more uh, bit rate on a wavelength, then the DSP needs to run faster or perform more calculation. But I would say that, uh, let's say, if you look at the Aetna DSP, what is available now, moving from 100G to 250G, there's about a 20% uh, change of power uh, while the bit rate is uh, two and a half times bigger. So it, doesn't, it does not scale linearly with the bit rate. Is Aetna one of those volcanoes that's blowing up all the time? That's right, the one in the southern of Italy, yes. Yes, it's basically making sure that we can blow up capacity on the network. That's the idea. Which is kind of weird because the team that is working on the DSP is the result of us acquiring Coroptics about three years ago. And the team, the core team there is based in Nuremberg in Germany. So they picked up the name. I don't know exactly why. It was probably a way to let us know in Italy that they were not so happy with us and they were, <laughs> I'm kidding, I, I don't know. But yes, you're exactly right, that's the volcano. Again, sorry, I've taken a bit more of time. I apologize for that. But uh, again, if you have questions, please let me know. I'll be out as well if you want to have uh, some discussion. Thank, Thank you. you.